Hello. Are you enjoying BlenderCon so far? <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. it. It's the third day. It's uh, energy is running low. The smell is getting worse. Plus, there's other people. But it's fine. Let's get started. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, cat data optimization for and uh, methods and tools for HMI at BMW. But uh, first things first. Who am I? I'm Tom. I'm working for a company called Paradox Cat in Munich since December 21. Uh, I'm a 3D artist there, and I break tools. So if you happen to be an add-on developer or a Blender developer and need someone to tell you what you've done wrong, I'm the guy. Uh, quick uh, about uh, who we are. Uh, we were founded in 2009 as a game company, but uh, took on contracts for the automotive industry and noticed, well, there's a lot uh, more stable work there to be made uh, and money and, and stuff. So we've been doing that, and we've been, and we've been growing steadily since. Uh, we have about 100 employees, and we're located in Ingolstadt and in Munich in Germany, and in Bucharest in Romania. And we have a very nice office. So what do we do? Well, we uh, specifically uh, work on the, um, out, uh, on the infotainment system inside the car. Uh, which means uh, behind the steering wheel you have these uh, two uh, giant screens and there's a 3D representation of that car uh, that shows you um, if the doors are open, if everybody has put on the seat belts uh, and whatnot. And that hardware in there is automotive grade, which means it runs like a potato, but it's very robust. And uh, so some technical overviews. So we uh, use uh, Windows as our operating system, SVN for version control, uh, Blender, of course, uh, and for some custom add-ons, a tool called uh, Instalot, a little bit uh, about that later. Of course, Photoshop, Ramses Composer, which is the editor for our engine uh, that will then integrate it uh, into Android. And we use FBX as an exchange format and GLTF uh, for the engine. And everything has to fit into 15 megabytes of space. So why do we use Blender? Well, because it's open source, and because BMW is very much in favor of open source, and the engine that we're using was also developed by them and is open source as well. That's it, that's why we use Blender. So a quick overview uh, over what I will be talking about today. Uh, the car that I will uh, show you is the latest version of the uh, BMW X1, internally known as the U11. So if I say U11 of X1, it, it's the same car. It's just um, so into the internal designation that I often don't um, know the official one. Um, so I will tell you about uh, the data preparation data processing, uh, then uh, the optimization of the car itself, then the cleanup, then, how, uh, then I will show how it's integrated into the engine, and then eventually on the dev hardware. So data preparation, where we create uh, raw files uh, for us to work on. So we have uh, different uh, variants or trim lines, uh, as we call it. And they come in as complete cars. So what we have to do first is uh, delete a whole bunch of uh, redundant parts that are repeated throughout each uh, trim line. They can have up to 90 million polygons each. They come in as uh, FVX files, and they can take up to 40 minutes or so to import uh, into Blender. And those files can range between 500 uh, megabytes to 1.5 uh, gigabytes which can result in blend files that go up to eight or even 10 gigabytes. So please turn off autosave if you have ever uh, to do something like this. And um, just to illustrate, uh, these are the uh, uh, trimline relevant parts. So everything in white is uh, standard in every car. Everything that's colored here can vary. And then the uh, customer can decide what kind of uh, car they want to have. And just a quick example, here we have the base model and the uh, uh, sports model, and um, there are many more, but I've uh, reduced it to two 
for this talk. So what do we do? First thing is first, we apply all the transforms and delete the keyframes. We have to consolidate materials because we don't care if something is clear plastic or, or glass, uh, they look the same. Uh, we don't care if it's um, uh, this kind of plastic or that kind of plastic. If they look similar enough, they will be consolidated. And uh, we have to restructure uh, the data that we get in order to be able to work with it. And we cut meshes in half where we need them so we can mirror them over in the engine. So the hood, for example, we only work on the left side, so that will be then mirrored over. And just to give you a quick overview of how this will look like, uh, we are using um, the uh, collection system in Blender uh, a lot for this. And just to keep everything in order so our automated uh, tools can then uh, process everything. So we have tools for automated imports, semi-automated sorting of parts, and assignment of uh, metadata. They basically look like this on the sidebar. Super exciting, I know, so let's move on. But one thing I uh, will show you is uh, metadata. Basically, we are using uh, Blender's custom properties system to assign additional data uh, that we need for the car. For example, what was the original material? Uh, wh where will the pivot be located? Is it mirrored or not? And uh, also to kind of circumvent Blender's 63 character limit on a mesh item because we uh, exceed that easily. And uh, this is one way to get around that. And then once the data prep has been done, we have a master file with only 40 million polygons after data prep and it looks nice and pristine. And the structure kind of looks like this. I'm totally gonna let that scroll through twice. Nah, just kidding, let's move on. So, data processing, this is where I come in. And you can tell I'm loving my job very much. And um, yeah, here we go. We, uh, the car has been split into different uh, resource groups, so it can be distributed among different artists. So um, one person can work on the hood, the others on the front doors, the next one on, uh, on the exterior parts. And um, we separate the car into exterior, interior, mixed parts, and the rims. Rims are a whole other topic uh, in and of themselves. And after that is done, we also add in some light effects and various helper meshes to fill in a gap here or to guide reflections over there. And uh, these are the parts that the uh, individual artists can uh, work on. So we have front drawers, back drawers, charging flaps. But for the sake of this talk, I will focus only on the front door or else we will be here all day. So this is uh, the front door of the U11 or, or the X1. Um, this is what it looks like. This is what one part of it looks like. So first things first, we have to get rid of everything that will not be visible, everything that you can see inside of there. This is the topology that we have to work with. Uh, if you're lucky, then uh, things are merged. If you're unlucky, then every face will be by itself. So it's a lot of uh, cleanup that we have to do. Fortunately, we have uh, custom tools to uh, help us with that. For example, we have one tool that lets us uh, bake ambient occlusion into the mesh, and then we can just paint in and out uh, uh, manually where the mesh will be visible and where not. And if we're done with that, we hit apply, and then that part gets deleted. And uh, that has also been uh, uh, realized using uh, geometry nodes, which I hear you li guys like to hear. So, yay, geometry nodes. And uh, once everything is uh, done and cleaned up, it kind of looks like this. So all the holes have been deleted. Every mesh that cannot be seen will be deleted. Uh, every polygon that's not seen I is uh, deleted. And that was the exterior part. For the interior part, uh, which looks like this, we have a totally different approach because we bake that down. 
And uh, just to uh, show you an example, this is all geometry. There are no textures in there. And uh, if you get speakers like this, internally we call them cheese graters. And uh, unfortunately, they also need to be cleaned up, but not to the same extent as the exterior. So data optimization, or as we call it, uh, crunch. And just to clarify, um, crunch refers to crunching the data itself so it can fit into where it needs to. It doesn't mean we're having lots of overtime. We're not an animation studio. So, and we don't do this in Blender, but instead we're doing it in a tool called uh, Instalot. And the reason for that is because Instalot is just great at what it does. It does one thing and one thing only, and that is uh, polygon optimization while keeping normals uh, intact. So, uh, on occasion, we also use the decimate modifier, but it only gets you so far. And yeah, we use it for the polygon uh, reduction for the exterior and for baking down the parts for the interior. Kind of looks like uh, this. It's a very basic UI. I'm not going to tell you too much about this tool, but uh, just an, as, a, as an example, you can see uh, this uh, door right here th with the topology that we have. And right now we're at around uh, 23,000 um, uh, vertices. Once we hit uh, one or two magic buttons, it goes down to around 700, and it uh, retains most of the normal data. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, as for the uh, interior, as you can see, we have uh, around 300,000 polygons, and this is the um, topology that we're having here. So you can see it's the wireframe is so dense, it's basically the entire mesh. And once we're done with it, this is the topology that we get out of it. It looks totally horrible but it uh, does exactly what it's supposed to do, and it's down to uh, around 3,600 polygons. So yeah, if you like clean topology, this is the wrong talk for you because <laughs> <laughs> everything you ever known about 3D and topology and making it look nice, yeah, for forget about it. This, this is not what we do. And of course, this is uh, how it looks when uh, textures are uh, baked down to it. So of course, um, we have to clean that part uh, up as well, because yes, the, mesh, uh, the remeshing is uh, very good and almost usable, but it, for what we do, it, it's not quite perfect. So as you can see, there's lots of broken geometry all over the place, and we have to clean that up, and yeah, th there's just no way around it. We, ha we have to do it. So yeah. Front side, back side, um, yeah. S sometimes this is also w w part of the 3D artist job. Not everything can be sunshine and rainbows. But then, of course, comes the fun part because um, even though most of the normal data is uh, so contained, some uh, normals get broken and we have to fix them. And unfortunately, Blender's normal tools are not quite up to the task, but we also found a workaround that I'm going to tell you about. And in most cases, for example, uh, when a normal is broken, we can select the vertex, uh, uh, tell it to reset the vector, that will fix it, but then that will break the vertex next to it, so you fix that, and then it becomes a whack-a-mole and everything around uh, is starting to break. So in the past, what we did is um, remesh with a, a higher setting, which gave us a crisper look, but also increased the poly count. Fortunately, we don't have to do that anymore because we now have a tool for that. And as an example, for example, this uh, edge right here was a little bit too hard, so uh, we had to um, adjust it a little bit, so we made a cut in there, but that uh, breaks normals in the process. And uh, yeah, as you can see, um, these are the normal issues that we have. So what we do instead, we have an automated tool that lets us uh, re-import the high poly mesh and then reproject the normals onto the low poly and uh, using uh, vertex groups, we can tell it where to reproject and uh, where not. 
And uh, you can do this by default in Blender by applying the modifier, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, we have a tool for that that basically makes it into one or two clicks. And uh, that way we don't have to constantly go back and forth between um, Blender and Insula. And uh, up for the next up is uh, texturing for the, um, for the interior part. So we bake uh, the curvature, the ambient occlusion, and the object space normal. And we do that to fake lighting. So here we have the curvature, here we have the ambient occlusion, and here we have the object space normal, of which we only use the green channel, so we can uh, fake light coming from top to bottom. And then we multiply that in Photoshop uh, to layer it on top of each other. And then we use a gamma correction to make it uh, dark because it's not super visible on the inside, but it has to be there. And of course, we automated that as well. So we have a Photoshop action. You press the button, and then it will ask you for the uh, uh, specific textures. You hit a couple times OK. It will also apply the gamma correction by itself. And that's basically uh, how we get our automated texture. It looks totally horrible. It's not supposed to be human readable or editable, but it works. And then we're, when we're all said and done, we have a door with around 32,000 or rather 16,000 because this one is mirrored over uh, triangles compared to hundreds of thousands or even millions uh, of polygons, but uh, it still looks uh, nice and crisp. So, Ramsification, what's that? Well, our engine is called uh, the Ramses engine, and our um, tool have, has a naming convention that basically tells us, okay, make it uh, ready for the uh, Ramses engine, which means um, we have to restructure the assets from a logical hierarchy into a material-based hierarchy. So, everything that uh, is the same material but in a different mesh will be grouped together because upon export they will be merged uh, down so we have as little draw calls uh, as possible. And that uh, basically looks like this. First we have a sanity checker that checks is everything uh, all right uh, with this assets, um, are there textures that need to be deleted, is there a second UV map that's not supposed to be there and uh, only once at a sun we can click the Ramsify button which uh, restructures the thing to what we need to and only then will also the export be enabled. <coughs> and uh, just to give you an overview, these are the possible errors that can come up. I would say about half of them I found and uh, the tool developer was very happy that he got more work. But uh, in the process, it made the whole thing very robust. So, what if we want to iterate? So, let's say we have to uh, we have uh, exported everything; it's all ready. But then uh, a reviewer comes in and says, "Hey, hey, you have to do redo this uh, and that." So, here's a little cheat sheet. We have a raw file. We clean it up. Then we process it through Insula. Clean it up. Ramsified, then there's a review. If that checks out, everything goes on to the repository. If not, then we use a tool called the Blendifier, which reverses the whole process, and then you iterate until everything is perfect. So that's where the Blendifier comes in, which, uh, yeah, as I just said, uh, reverses the thing. So basically, we have this uh, tool, and uh, you can get the lock directly inside, uh, the, the SVN lock directly inside of um, Blender, so you don't edit things uh, by accident. And uh, then you select the part that you want, hit uh, Blendify, and that part gets automatically imported. Uh, that's the edit mode. We also have a review mode where you can just look at one or more uh, parts individually. And then basically have a look at the entire car if you like. But then again, there's also the trim lines or the variants. So we have a tool for that as well that lets you basically switch between those uh, different variants. And you can see on the right-hand side that uh, various collections get uh, turned on and off so they don't overlap and we don't have to spread them out to be able to work on the parts. 
So, um, quick overview of the uh, Ramses engine. By the way, that logo has been uh, rendered in Blender. Yay! And uh, it's basically a super lightweight uh, open source uh, 3D editor for the Ramses engine. It's uh, all Lua based. You have a little bit of Python support to automate things. And <laughs> do not try to make games in it. I mean, you're welcome to try, but uh, I highly want to discourage you. A uh, quick overview over how uh, that uh, looks. It's, I'm going to get so much shit for that, but it's basically a retarded Unity. And uh, you, you have an outliner, you have a history, you have your options. Uh, we don't have a free viewport yet, but that's uh, coming soon. And um, yeah, it, it's basically you have OpenGL, you have the Ramses engine, and then you have the editor on top, so it's extremely lightweight, so it does one thing and one thing only, and that does it very well. So what does the asset structure inside of Ramses uh, look like? It's a little bit scary, um, but basically it's nested scenes and nested scenes and nested scenes. So on the right-hand side, you have all the assets, which then go into the logic structure, which then go into their individual car structure, and finally, we have an export layer on top. So in every step, uh, people can um, edit where it needs to, and it's very non-destructive. And when all is said and done, this is the final result. This is how it looks in the engine. This is how it will uh, appear later in the car. All shiny and crisp, and it has a round, uh, yeah, less than 200, maybe 300,000 polygons. So the overall reduction is uh, 99.8 percent, something in, in that realm. And uh, the whole process, it highly depends on the data, can be done in two to three weeks or up to three months. It really depends on how clean or unclean the data is. And uh, once that is done, it goes on to the DEF hardware, which uh, we call the REC. It's basically a um, um, giant clunky DEF kit, but uh, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. And once it, uh, it's running on, on there and everything works, it goes into the car on the screen that you see here behind the steering wheel. And that is basically it. Thank you very much. <laughs>